Philadelphia. The word means city of brotherly love, and that was certainly an accurate description in 1740, thanks to the preaching of George Whitfield, America's first great evangelist. A friend of John Wesley's, Whitfield had undergone a powerful conversion and had been used by God to bring the message of salvation to the coal mines of Middle England, where thousands of miners gathered in the fields to hear for the first time that Jesus Christ loved them. Whitfield came to America at Wesley's suggestion, and his arrival coincided with the lightning storm of revival known as the Great Awakening. The lightning rod who carried it the furthest was George Whitfield. He rode up and down the eastern seaboard, sometimes preaching as often as three times a day. And wherever he went, revival broke out. Here in Philadelphia, he would stand on the steps of the old courthouse and with great enthusiasm exhort the multitudes who came from miles around to hear him. His message was so simple, it seemed revolutionary. Salvation was available to anyone, high-born or low, self-righteous or miserable sinner. All were equal at the foot of the cross. Whitfield would stand here and then look to heaven and cry, Father Abraham, whom have you there in heaven? Any Episcopalians? And back comes the answer, no. Any Methodist? And again comes the same word, no. Whom have you there in heaven then, Father Abraham? And again comes the answer, we don't know those names here. All we have here are Christians, believers in Christ, men who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Standing in the vast crowd listening to Whitfield was America's foremost scientist, Benjamin Franklin. He was fascinated by the effect that the message was having on its listeners and also by the extraordinary projection of the speaker's voice. Retracing his steps back down Market Street, Franklin calculated that in an open field, George Whitfield's voice could be heard by 30,000 people. And so each day that Whitfield returned here to preach, so did Benjamin Franklin. It's wonderful to see the change that's taking place in our inhabitants from being thoughtless and indifferent about religion. Good day. Good afternoon. It seems now as if the whole world has gone religious. One cannot walk through town in the evening without hearing psalms sung by families on every street in Philadelphia. In light of what Franklin said in this building years later, one has to wonder if old Ben's heart might not have been touched by the gospel after all. It was 1787 and delegates from the 13 new states had gathered here to hammer out the terms on which they would become a nation. No point is of more importance than that the right of impeachment should be continued. Shall any Things were not going well. For in order to establish a national government under a constitution that would work not just now but in the future, the states were being called upon to relinquish some of their sovereign rights and thus create and come under an authority that was greater than themselves. And this they did not want to do. Contention reigned to the extent that practically everyone in this room had given up hope that there would ever be a republic. I say the Confederation does not have the power to discuss and propose it. New York would never have concurred in sending deputies to the convention if, if she had supposed it were to discuss a national government. At this crucial moment, Ben Franklin, known to be an agnostic and now 81 years old, rose to address the convention. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. And our prayers, sir, were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence intervening in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? 
Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I therefore beg that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed. The assembly was stunned. No one spoke while all considered what he had said. Franklin's speech marked the turning point of the deliberations. From there on, progress was made, and the Constitution and the United States of America came into being.